as it is um, an international day and celebrated across the world. In relation to registering for these talks, um, I've been sending out emails to people and I know I did get a few emails this morning from people to say that they didn't receive the mail. Um, I, there's been one or two bounce backs in email addresses. So those people obviously aren't on this call this morning. Um, we don't have another way of contacting them except from the email address that they've given us. So unfortunately, they may feel a little left out. But um, as if, if you know of somebody who didn't get the link, ask them to contact events at ageaction.ie and, um, and we'll do our best to, to include them on the list going forward. Um, I did have a question from somebody the other day when I sent an email out and they wanted to know, do they have to register for each talk? Um, the reason I suppose we're doing it like that is that the link for the talk does change each time. It's not the same link. So, and it also allows us, I suppose, to see how many people are interested in the particular topic. I mean, at the moment, we have 32 participants on this call, um, 70 people registered. Um, so there's a number of people maybe who have registered and for whatever reason couldn't join us this morning or maybe will join us later. But it's to allow us, was everybody an opportunity because the call, the way we have Zoom set up, we can take 100 people on, on these webinar calls. So it's again, not to have um, people taking up places that other people might want. So that's why we're registering each call individually at the moment. And just, you may have heard Tara say at the beginning there, in terms of questions during the talk, um, she's happy to take questions. And we can also, like we did the last day, if you were on the call, if you use the chat button, if you want to do that, um, please feel free. And Annette and Carol are going to look after that and they'll feed us the, the questions that come through. So for the moment, if you want to participate, I suppose, you need to unmute yourself um, in terms of if you want to ask a question. So you should see on the little blue button on the top, which says on the right hand, it's on the right hand corner of my picture. I assume it's the same on all of yours, where it says mute and then you have the three little dots. So you can unmute and mute yourself there. Okay, so that's um, really it, except to um, introduce Tara Shine to you. Uh, Tara, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I know we had a little bit of a, and it was totally my fault in terms of a mix up in dates at the beginning of this. Um, in, in a conversation we had, I didn't take down the, the right date in my notes. So apologies, Tara, and thank you for making yourself available this morning. And I, I'm really just gonna hand you over to Tara because I've sent out, I suppose, a little blurb about you, Tara, in the email. So people will be familiar with some of your work and what you've done. And if they were watching RTE, in the last few weeks they may have seen you on telly also um so um, i'll hand you over to our television star tara Shine. <laughs> not feeling like much of a television star sitting in my attic talking to you all but uh thank you lovely to to have been invited thank you um billy and carol and annette and the university of third age and sounds amazing and, and age action it's a pleasure to be on talking to you all um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I made a little PowerPoint, so I am going to share my screen with you all so you can see that. Um, I'll do that now. And um, so let me make sure I've hit all the buttons. And here we go. So you should be able to hopefully see my little presentation. Um, so what we're going to talk about today um, is a little bit about you know, saving the planet, right? Saving the planet sounds very big and very grand and out of the reach of most of us. But what I'd love to do in this talk today is to personalize a little bit for us all, kind of our, our relationship that we have with the earth around us and, and what we can do to create positive change. And even from our own homes, even, even if now we're, we're, we're not traveling the world, we're not going as many places as, as we used to, even in our local communities, even just within the bounds of our own houses, what could we be doing to be contributing to a greater, you know, a more sustainable way of living, a greater respect for uh, this lovely earth that we call home. And what I wanted to do is just kind of start with a kind of a reflection on where we are at the moment. This is not to depress the life out of you all, by the way, um, but rather just kind of to put things in perspective. So um, we, we know that the current, I guess, concern that most of us have and the greatest risk that we're facing at the moment is around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how we manage that. And that is consuming a lot of decision makers time and a lot of our own energies in, in making sure we're abiding by rules and playing our part. But what we know too is that um, COVID is only one part of what we need to uh, you know, make policies for, make decisions for. There are other things out there. So we know that COVID is, is leading the world into a global recession, so we're gonna to have to manage that. 
But we still have the challenge of climate change there lingering, um, and we are seeing increasingly, even while we're dealing with COVID, the impacts of climate change. So if you have family living along the west coast of the United States at the moment, you'll know that they're not just dealing with uh, the issues around COVID and can they send their kids to school and washing hands and social distancing, but they're having to do that at the same time as they're managing very poor air quality and um, having to wear a, a different type of mask, a more significant uh, N95 mask to make sure that their air is being filtered. They're having to close their windows. Some of them are having to purify the air inside their homes. And they may even be having to think about evacuating in order to be safe because the wildfires, which are becoming more intense and more frequent due to climate change, are another layer of risk that they're having to manage on top of everything else. And so this is the kind of stuff I think too much about because I'm an environmental scientist that has worked on climate change for over 20 years. And because I think about these things, what I've spent the last 20 years predominantly doing was trying to sort out some of these problems at the international level. And so uh, I worked a lot, for example, in the Convention on, on Climate Change. So with the United Nations and things like the Sustainable Development Goals, you may have heard of the Paris Agreement, which came out in 2015, which is a new international legally binding agreement on climate change. Um, and these photos are from my time working with the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. Um, and just to kind of illustrate that, what I used to do, and which was really amazing work to be a part of, was to try and shape global policy right from the very top down. And when you create something like a new legal agreement at the international level, it's incredibly powerful because it impacts on every single country in the world and it's negotiated and agreed by every single country in the world. But it then takes quite a long time to filter down from the international level to the national level into the legislation that we have here in Ireland and into the types of um, changes you might see coming to you through policy that the government uh, implements or actions that your local authority is taking. So it's really impactful, but it takes a long time. Um, and so I guess having done that for 20 years, I thought about, well, what else might I be able to do to contribute to solving uh, the problem of climate change and making sure that I help people Hello. to live more sustainably? Um, Hello. Hi. Are you okay? The person talking? Yes, who? Maybe Hello? if you're just getting sorted, maybe go on mute and, and have a listen until we're taking the questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so, you know, it can seem in the face of a big global problem, like those big waves that I showed, so, you know, COVID-19 and the climate crisis. So is individual action any point? You know, are we goosed anyway? Is it worth you changing anything in your life or do you really have power? Um, this is a, a little article a title I found from a, a magazine called The Conversation where it says individual action won't achieve the, the emissions reductions we need to stay at 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, I'll explain that now in a second. And uh, we actually need social change as history shows. And I, this gets me thinking, how do we create social change? And surely individual action has a role in creating social change. The 1.5 degrees relate, referred to here is, is a really important number in my world and in that international world of decision making and in this Paris Agreement. So what scientists have been trying to work out for years and years is what is a safe level of warming for the world? So we know what the normal temperatures of the earth should be. And then what we spent a lot of time trying to figure out is how much warmer can the earth get, the global system get, without us getting to a point where the earth becomes so sick that the basic fundamental systems that keep our planet safe and us as humanity safe living here, um, what ha at what stage does, does that all become too unstable? And for, for years we thought that was about that the world could warm two degrees more than average and we'd be okay. But then more science, more information shows that actually two degrees is unsafe, two degrees of warming. We cannot let uh, the global temperature increase by more than 1.5 degrees if we want to stay safe, be able to feed ourselves, not have conflict over um, dwindling water resources, that type of thing. And shockingly, we have already warmed the planet by just over one degree Celsius since we started the Industrial Revolution, since we started to burn coal. And so we have very, very little time left to make sure that we don't warm the earth by the remaining less than half a degree we have in order to stay safe. And you know, in the end of the day, the earth is going to be fine. It's really us as humanity that live in earth that will suffer. 
So this is a really important question. Can individual action actually help in creating the systemic change that we need in every single country around the world to solve something as big and challenging as climate change? And I love this quote. This quote is from Christiana Figueres. She is the woman who uh, was at the, the helm of the UN climate change negotiations that led to this famous Paris Agreement. And she wrote a book recently called The Future We Choose. Um, and, and she said this, every time you make an individual choice to be a responsible custodian of this beautiful earth, you contribute to major transformation. And this is the same way that I think. I think that each of us in our individual roles, using our power as a citizen, as a consumer, as a grandparent, as a friend, as a neighbor, using these powers, we all are able to make change and we're all able to be part of the transformation. But I also know, uh, and I'd be interested to hear, do you guys feel the same? I also know that a lot of people feel that they don't know where to start. They find the information confusing. Um, they still question whether, you know, you know, turning off the lights and driving the car less really has an, an impact over time. And so what I decided I might like to do was to write a book uh, to enable everybody you don't have to be green to be part of this movement, but something that would help everybody in their own houses and in their own worlds to be part of this great major transformation that we need to take to protect the earth that we rely on for food and for water and for clean air. We can't, we can't live without these things and we can't, start, we can't keep taking them for granted. And so this is me in the office that I'm in talking to. This is me in the office that I'm talking to you from now. And I spent far too many years here, far too many hours here last year, uh, researching a book about everyday objects that are in our homes. Everything from the glasses that I should probably have on me, but I'm too vain, to the notebooks that I write in, to the computer that I'm talking to you on. All these everyday objects that we have, I decided I was gonna research them and find out what their environmental impact was and figure out if there were ways that I could help people to have alternative ways of using these objects or alternatives to them completely that would help them live more sustainably. Because what I want to do is create a conversation about how good it is to make some of these changes in your life. And you're not going to do these things to save the planet. You're going to do them because they make your life better, because they make you healthier, because they save you money. And almost the side, the side benefit is that they're also going to be good for your planet, the world that you live in, your immediate surroundings. Um, yeah, so this is where I spent an awful lot of hours at reading some of the most boring articles on chemistry and physics and life cycle analysis. Um, and what I hope is in writing this book, I've saved you all the bother of doing that and boiled a whole lot of information down in very plain, accessible English to help people understand what the impact is of these most everyday things um, on our world and what you can do. Most importantly, what you can do. Um, so I thought it might be nice. They made a little, um, as Billy mentioned, I um, was part of a nationwide program there a couple of weeks ago, still up there on the RTE player if you want to look back at it. Um, which came and kind of documented some of the work I was doing and gave some of the tips out of my book. And what it does, I think, is tells the story of why I think uh, your action, your individual action matters. So I'm just going to show that little clip to you now just to give you a little insight into my life. Uh, I live down here in Kinsale in County Cork. So as you see, that's a very, very lucky place to live. It's a very beautiful place to live. <laughs> I don't think we will make these changes to save the planet. I think we'll make them because they're good for us. That's why we have to, in some ways as well, unpack this from being something that's just a green agenda to something that's about building a better world for us all. That's just to give you a little flavor, I guess, of my motivations. And yeah, what I really want to do is, I guess, democratize sustainability. I'm tired of... Uh, sustainability and how to live better on, to live better, to live more healthily, to live more economically, to belong under this green banner and only for green people. You don't have to be green to be doing amazing things. This is something I want to be for everybody. And as I say, that's why I've chosen the most banal, ordinary objects to talk about in my book. 
Um, and what I want to do, this is a picture of the front cover of the book. Um, and what I want to do is give you and share with you today some of those tips that are in the book and um, some examples of really everyday objects that are probably sitting right around you now as you're listening to this. Um, and then to invite your questions, like you can ask me about anything, any kind of everyday thing that's around you and I'll do my best to answer. Uh, I may not have all the information to hand, but I'll certainly do my best. And if I don't know, I can go and find out and come back to you. Um, so I'm really thrilled that people have recognized that this book is an unpreachy guide uh, and that it's accessible to everybody. Um, because that was a key part of the hard work and uh, was really good having an editor to work with that kept coming back to me and saying, Tara, you have to say that in plainer English. Go again, go again. Um, it's a really, really good process for scientists like myself to go through to work with editors that make you say things in plain English and lose all of the jargon and make your message really clear. Um, so let's start in the kitchen. So I am sure that one of the first things that many of you did this morning when you went into your kitchen was turn on the kettle. How many of you filled the kettle up to the top just out of habit, even though maybe you're only making tea for one or two people? So when you do this, all that you're doing is wasting your own money. Um, every time you overfill the kettle, um, you are costing yourself money and you're adding to the carbon footprint of your cup of tea. So you might think, oh, most of the carbon footprint of a cup of tea is going to come from the fact that it was grown in Kenya and then it had to be picked and it had to be shipped and it had to be made into tea bags and uh, get to my cupboard. And that's where most of the carbon footprint of my cup of tea comes from. Shockingly, it doesn't. Most of the carbon footprint from your cup of tea, 80% of it comes from boiling the water to make the tea. So if every single time you make you boil the kettle for tea, you overfill the kettle and you get a bit forgetful about it and you actually boil it three times before you make the cup of tea. Um, all you're doing is adding to the carbon footprint of your cup of tea. So what do you do? Use the little measure on the size of the kettle or uh, measure out. So say this was a cup, measure out the cup, throw it in the kettle, then boil just the amount that you need. What you're doing then is you are actually having a really big impact on the amount of energy you use, you're reducing it, your um, bill that you get is going to be lower, your electricity bill, and you're going to know that you're doing something fabulous for your planet. So then the next time your grandkids say, oh, granny, you don't do anything. I'm the one always telling you what to put and where in the recycling bin. You can say, ah, yes, but I'm taking great action and I'm reducing the carbon footprint of my cup of tea. So that's one to start off with the kettle. Uh, another little kitchen tip related to tea is did you know there is plastic in tea bags? In almost all of the tea bags that are on sale at the moment, including your favorites like Barry's, I'm based down here in Cork after all, um, they contain plastic. So there's a, a plastic that's used actually in the fiber of the, of the tea bag and also in the glue that holds the tea bag together. And any of you that are gardeners and have a compost bin have probably noticed that you put the tea bags in the compost bin and they hang around there for ages, even though the tea leaves inside may be ready to compost, the actual bags are not breaking down. And that's because there's plastic in most of our tea bags. So those of you who appreciate a very, very, very good cup of tea will know that the best cup of tea is made with loose tea in a teapot. Um, and that is also uh, the most environmentally way to drink your tea, um, loose without the plastic tea bag. So get inquisitive a little bit about your tea bags. Um, buy loose tea if you can. And I would say that the things to absolutely avoid are the, are the tea bags that come in a box with cellophane around them, which is not recyclable. And then each tea bag inside is individually wrapped. Like that is just a bonkers amount of waste produced with uh, an individual tea bag. Um, yeah, and one thing to remember there is those soft plastics that are used to, to wrap around bread, wrap around your tea bags that hold your rice and your pasta, none of those are recyclable in Ireland at the moment. Make sure none of those are going in your recycling bin. That all unfortunately has to go into our rubbish bins because we don't have any way to recycle it. Okay, I'm going to go with a few more of these tips and don't worry, there's going to be time for loads of questions and you can ask me about anything that's around your house that you're inquisitive about. Um, now, a utility room tip. So any of you of your generation, I'm thinking, uh, probably know this, um, but drying your clothes outside on the line, like you always did growing up, um, saves loads of energy. 
tumble dryers use an inordinate amount of energy. So that is A, pushing up your bill, but B, adding carbon to the atmosphere if that energy is coming from one of our gas powered um, electricity plants, for example. So the less you use your tumble dryer, the kinder you are to your clothes um, and the kinder you are to your environment. So again, clothes are interesting. You would think most of the carbon footprint, most of the environmental impact of your clothes would come from growing the cotton, uh, manufacturing them, shipping them from wherever they're made in Bangladesh or whatever to Ireland. But actually, most of the carbon footprint of your clothes comes from how much you wash and dry them. So, for example, if you own a pair of jeans, the guidance is you should only wash the jeans. Uh, and this would apply too to any kind of uh, wool or cotton based trousers that you might have. Um, you should only be washing those once every 10 to 11 washes, um, once to 10 or to 11 wears, excuse me. And I think what your generation might also know, but which younger generations have forgotten, is that sometimes hanging particularly natural fibres out on the line is enough to freshen them up, get the smells out of them and wear them again. So the less you can wash and dry your clothes, um, the less their carbon footprint. And any time you can hang something on a line, finish it off on an air or overnight um, and avoid using a tumble dryer, um, the better you're being for the environment. So if, like me, you don't even have a tumble dryer, you're already a rock star in terms of your environmental footprint. Right, another one from the utility room. If I was to come into your house and go under the sink, or uh, what would there be? Would there be a plethora of different products in there? Have you got four types of pledge and a Dettol spray and a specialist product for cleaning this and that and one for the bathroom and one for the kitchen? And how much bleach have you got, et cetera, et cetera. The more of these products you have in your house, the more chemicals you're exposing yourself to on a daily basis. And even with things as, as, as commonplace as bleach, research has showed, research done on nurses over a period of 40 years has shown that they actually develop some certain illnesses of their lungs from consistent and constant exposure to the chemicals that are even within bleach. Um, and whilst we need some of these products perhaps right now to make sure that you're keeping your surfaces clean and you're protecting yourself from COVID, as a general rule, the less you have, the better. Try and buy fewer of these products. If you have fewer of them, there's fewer plastic containers and aluminium containers that go with them. And think about trying to you have, for example, one type of spray. So I have one spray in my house. It's an eco spray that I get from a, a local lady who does a refill um, service. And it's made from things like vinegar and bicarbonate of soda, uh, bread soda. And I can use that to clean my countertops, my kitchen, my bathroom, when the kids spill something on the floor. There's multiple uses and it's completely natural. I know that I'm not spraying any kind of dangerous chemical uh, around my kids or myself. So avoid the temptation to buy a specialist product for every type of cleaning task as a, as a, as a bare minimum. The other thing I have that uh, I'm quite proud of is I have uh, a a washing up liquid bottle, bottle that I've had for over two years that I just refill and refill with a, an eco washing up liquid that again I get from a, a refill shop. Um, and again, I know every time I refill that, that's another plastic container avoided. So uh, that feels good. So if those are starting to pop up around where you live, they can be a great thing to do. And a lot of the supermarkets are now thinking about bringing that in as a service that they will offer as well. So if we go into the living room, now I'm not sure where your thermostat is in your house. It might be in the hall, it might be in the living room. Um, but, uh, and I know that if you're, if you're at home, and I also know if you're an older person, um, you might need to keep your home a bit warmer than, than my home. But nevertheless, every time you turn your, te your thermostat down, even by a degree, you're saving money. So turning your, your thermostat down a degree um, will save you up to 10% off your electricity bills. And that's quite a lot. 10% is a significant saving over the course of a year. So your temperature, your thermostat in your house would typically be for between 18 and 20 degrees. You obviously need to be comfortable and you need to keep well and safe. Um, and I would say another thing is if you, do, if you have a thermostat and you are uh, not really using it, you're just kind of pressing the button for it on and off, get somebody to come in and show you how to use it. Because using your thermostat effectively um, also helps you to be more efficient and to lose more energy. So if you have a fancy thermostat and you find it confusing and you just end up using the finger, um, get one of those clever grandchildren or something to come in and help you figure out how to work it. It will save you money in the end of the day. Also in the living room, right? In Ireland, we love our open fires and we love our stoves. Um, but did you know how bad 
our open fires and our stoves are for our health. An open fire in particular, if you're burning things like briquettes or coal, is actually causing indoor air pollution. So you're breathing, it, breathing in particulate matter and you're breathing, breathing in black carbon. All of these are bad for your lungs. Um, but also, as, as most of that uh, smoke is going up the chimney and out into our air, it's creating outdoor air pollution. And in Ireland, a lot of our air to outdoor air pollution comes from cars, particularly in urban areas, but also from um, open fires and stoves. Um, so the best, if you, if, you're, if you are, like many Irish people, absolutely in love with your fire, then know that the best option is to have a wood burning stove that is installed by a professional so it's well installed and it works well and burn in it only uh, kiln dried wood. Wet wood unfortunately also produces uh, a lot of air pollution which is bad for our lungs and what you might have heard about recently too is if we already have a precondition in terms of respiratory health whether that's asthma or CPD, it makes us more vulnerable and more susceptible to COVID-19. So we all really have an added imperative to keep our lungs healthy and well. Um, so I know that many, many of you are not going to like hearing that, but uh, the, the more you can um, avoid coal and, and wet wood uh, and, and peat in your fireplace, the healthier you will be. Yeah, so one wood burning stove produces as much air pollution per hour as 18 diesel cars. So that's a bit of a shocker, that fact. Now, your garden. Some of you may have gardens, garages, garden sheds. There's lots you can do in those as well. Um, if you have some grass, uh, perhaps you're a really uh, fastidious garden lawnmower. Um, that's good, probably keeping you fit and getting you out in the air. But actually, if you can leave a little part of your garden to go wild, that is the easiest thing you can do to encourage wildlife into your garden, to provide a habitat for all kinds of insects and bugs, and to keep the bees that we so badly need for pollination healthy and well. So it only requires a little bit of laziness on your part, just to let a little part of the garden go wild or perhaps cut it a little less regularly. Another thing that the um, proud gardeners of you may be using quite a lot of, particularly earlier in the year, is pesticides, so weed killers. Um, again, just look at what's in a weed killer sometime. Um, a lot of what's in there is, is toxic. It says toxic on the bottle. Um, it's something that you need to be really careful with if you're, if you're using it. It's not good for our health and it's really not good at all for biodiversity. So there are other ways of getting rid of weeds. You can obviously, um, again, employ the grandchildren to put the weeds out. I find that's very effective even with my own kids. Or you can try pouring on things like vinegar, boiling water or salt onto the weeds to, to kill them off in a way that is more uh, kind to you and your health and kinder to the environment. Uh, another thing you can think about in terms, I don't know how many of you have dogs or cats, um, dog waste obviously is a critical problem all around Ireland. Uh, the absolute worst is when someone puts their dog poo in a dog poo bag, which is plastic, and leaves it hanging around for one of us to pick up. So there you're putting a absolutely biodegradable, compostable dog poo product inside plastic, which means that it, it can, then can um, hang around in the environment for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so what is good is if you have a dog and the dog is in the garden, um, try and just use a, a, sh a little shovel to pick up the dog poo and put that directly in your rubbish bin to avoid the number of the plastic bags that you use. Or you can install, if you have the space in your garden, dig a hole a meter or so deep and use that just to put uh, the dog poo in, no plastic bags, and that will biodegrade there. But know that you cannot put dog waste in your food waste bin, those brown bins, nor can you put it in your compost because the, the, dog, um, the dog poo may contain um, different types of contaminants that wouldn't be good for, for human health. So you don't want that back going on your tomatoes or something like that. So always make sure that it doesn't go in your compost bin. It either has to go in a special hole that you've dug or in your regular rubbish bin. Um, and if you've got a cat, a little tip around the cats um, is that cat litter contains all kinds of silicas and other things which again can cause problems for people's health around um, what they're breathing in and their lungs. And you can make cat litter yourself even out of old newspapers, just a matter of shredding them. If you have an office and you have a shredder, it's almost ready done for you as a job. So there's lots and lots of ways that you can reuse things and actually save yourself money as well as being better for your health. So 
here we go. What else would you like to know? We'll come back to this in a moment, but I'd love to invite your questions. Are there things in your bedroom, in your bathroom that you'd love to know what their environmental impact is or what could you do differently? Parties and celebrations is something I also cover in the book. Everything from balloons to wrapping paper, Christmas trees. Um, sports, are you into golf? Ever wondered about that? Or running or riding a bike or swimming and what the environmental impacts are of the objects that go with that. Um, you might have a home office. Uh, you might have kids going to kids and grandkids going to school from your home. And what other things might they do there? I will. I'm happy to answer any any and all of your questions in so far as I can. And as I say, this is a, a shameless plug, but this is the book, and it obviously has all the answers to all your questions um, with, within it. I hope. Um, and because what, what I what I think is really important is that, and what I'd love you all to take away from this talk is that. You, you, we're all powerful, each and every single one of us, whether we're a, a kid in school or, or, or you as, a, as an older respected person in, in your community and in your family. We all have power if A, we get informed. So I'd say that's be curious. You know, don't just take something off a shelf in the supermarket. Read the back of it. Um, if, you're, if something seems too, too cheap to be true, there's probably a reason for that. Um, if there's a whole lot of ingredients on the back of the of something and you don't understand what any of them are, well, maybe don't buy it. Um, but get informed and be curious about all of these everyday objects. Then take an action. No action is too small. So if all you do from today is make one change in your life, that is powerful. But it is particularly powerful if you tell somebody. Okay, so if as a result of this, say, for example, another thing I could have spoken to you about is how awful those plastic yellow and green sponges are that most of us have sitting at the side of the sink. They're made out of nothing but plastic. They take hundreds of years to biodegrade and they hold more bacteria in them uh, on average than is in your toilet and we're washing our dishes with them. So I have kicked the green, green and yellow plastic sponges out of my house and I have instead got a, a loofah sponge and I have a wooden um, dishwashing brush that I can change the, the heads on. Um, and there's less bacteria as a result in my house. And also I'm not putting a whole lot of additional plastic out into the world. But that is really powerful only if I tell somebody. So if you find a new type of scrubber that you like, which you find that works better, is nicer, is less smelly than a yellow and green sponge, then tell somebody. That could be your neighbor, your best friend, your daughter, your son, your grandkid, doesn't matter who it is. But every time you tell somebody, the ripple effect of your action grows and grows. And if we have many of us as individuals making many ripples, then we get to the kind of social systemic change that we need in order to turn the way we live and do business around in the next 10 years and to ensure that we leave a healthy planet for the generations to come. So listen, I am dying to hear from you all. Um, I'll take, you know, if you want to unmute and ask me a question, if you want to send it in in the chat box, I, I'm here to, 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 to chat with you all for the next <laughs> while. Um, if you want to know more about the kind of things that I talked about, you can look at my website, Change by Degrees is the name of my company, uh, or tarashine.com. And if you're looking for the book, um, you can find it in your local shop or order it on Easton, Gray, Amazon, wherever it is that you normally go and order things um, online. We've all got very good at that in the last while. Um, so thank you for listening to me and I hope uh, to hear from lots of you and get lots of questions. Um, thanks. So I'm going to actually, I'll go back up a slide here to give kind of uh, ideas for people of things to, to ask about. And yeah, Billy, happy to hear from anyone. I, I saw a, a, a picture yesterday. Somebody posted a picture from their local supermarket, which has already decked itself out with Christmas goods. And um, the, the, the Christmas word, Jane has just used it. I don't know if you can see the question there that Jane has raised, which is, what is the relative environmental impact of a real single-use Christmas tree and a reusable artificial tree? Excellent question. So I looked at this very carefully. Um, so if you have a artificial tree, there's a lot of feedback there. People Sorry, I was just going to go say and mute for a second. Yeah. Maybe really, you might just be able to mute everybody. Mute everybody. Yeah. Just, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to do that to everybody because there is background noise. Sorry. Bear with me. Yeah, 
if everybody mutes. Sorry, can everybody, uh, I've been trying to find the button here, it's just disappeared from me. That's, no. Sorry, one of the things about Zoom is that we're all learning all the time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay. you got it. Yeah. Well, well done. So this is okay. a great question around which is better for the environment, uh, real tree oh, or an artificial tree? Oh, try again there, Billy. Maybe. Sorry, guys. Um, if anyone can hear us, can you all just press the mute button on your on your screens? Sorry, Tara. We'll get this in a second. I've just lost, sorry, I, I know there's a way of doing that. I just lost where it is to find it. Um, my apologies. There's, you can even choose the individuals and mute them there, I think. There's one there person I just was able to mute. Okay. Maybe that will do it. Um, Geraldine has her hand up. No, no, it's Geraldine hand has, up. Yeah. Sorry, the joys of technology when it works, it's great, but um... Oh, I muted you. That's fine, thank you. I was looking for that button and I couldn't find it. Thank you. Right, Sorry, I muted done. everybody, including you. Let's see anyway okay. if that works. <laughs> so I think, we, 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 did we get to Jane's, because the noise in the background, I don't know, did we get to answer Jane's question on the Christmas tree? No, we're going to do that, I can do that okay. now. So it's a great question about Christmas trees. So which is better for the environment, a, a real tree or uh, an artificial tree? Um, so this is a bit of a fascinating thing to look at. So real tree are uh, fake trees, right? Synth are made, they're synthetic, they're made out of plastic. Um, and they're made out of lots of different types of plastic. So they can't be recycled. Um, so when they are broken and no longer of use, they have to go either to be incinerated or into a dump. And plastic, as you will know by now, I am sure, would last literally hundreds and hundreds of years um, in a landfill, or if the worst case, even if it escaped out into the environment as litter, would hang around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So a, synth a synthetic tree, they've done the, the analysis of it. If you, if you have um, a fake tree, the key thing to do is look after it. So put it away carefully in a cupboard or in the attic every single year and make sure you get at least 11 years use, 11 to 12 years use out of that tree. If you do that, you're starting to get a payback for the amount of resources that went into making the tree. But unfortunately, the actual um, waste that that tree produces <coughs> is still going to be an issue. Okay, so you can't recycle that tree right now into anything. There's no methodology to do that. Um, a real tree um, is a more sustainable option, particularly if you buy it locally. So the more local you buy it to you, the less it has to travel. That makes it more sustainable. If you're uh, supporting a local Christmas tree farm where you know that they're, uh, they're replacing those trees year on year, then that's a, that's a good thing. But the most sustainable tree, um, and I'm proud to say the tree I have, and it's the most least fuss tree in the world, is I have a living tree in a pot. So it's out in my back garden in its pot. I keep it in the pot. Now, if I planted it in the ground, it would grow and get huge. But the pot keeps it constrained in terms of the size that it is. And then what I have to do at Christmas is I don't have to go drive anywhere to pick up a tree. And I don't have to do the disposal of a real tree at the end. I just lift it back into the garden. So I have a tree that I literally shove out in the garden the whole year. And I actually ignore it. Um, I put a bit of seaweed on it about twice a year just for a bit of um, fertilizer. And I pull it in the back door. Um, for Christmas and we decorate it and I have it now over five years. So uh, A, it's saving me money and it saves me a hell of a lot of hassle and it is the most sustainable option. So that's, that's Christmas trees. And think about what you put on your Christmas trees too. There's an awful lot of plastic stuff that we can put on a Christmas tree. I always encourage people rather than sort of changing their decorations every Christmas or buying more and more plastic baubles to invest in like memory Christmas decorations, ones that are 
um, collected maybe that your grandchildren have made for you, that you've made together, ones handed down over the generations that maybe were on the Christmas tree when you were young. Um, and focus on those ones that um, will, will last through the years rather than maybe, you know, boxes and boxes of the plastic stuff which again, none of it can be recycled. So when you're sick of it, unfortunately, it goes in the rubbish bin and it ends up in the dump or being incinerated. Uh, so any more questions? <coughs> Excuse me. I see one from Cathy there, um, Tara. I don't know if you've seen this, about could you encourage people to bring their unwanted packaging to the shop? It's the one way to get the message across that they need to change the way things are packed or packaged rather. <laughs> Yeah, you can if you you can if you wish do that. Some people um some some people find that effective. Um, I think that's one way of getting the message through to to the retailers. But we we also have to talk to the manufacturers of the individual uh, products. So you know some things are easier to take out of the packaging than not. Like you can't take the rice out of the package yet. What rice and pasta comes in is actually one of the worst offenders. That soft plastic. What I would do is, is try and have a conversation with the people in the supermarket that you go to where you frequent and, and ask them, tell them you want more choice. Um, choice is the thing that we absolutely need. To, so if you have a supermarket local to you that allows you to buy your apples loose rather than always uh, in plastic, that allows you to buy the bread loose rather than wrapped in plastic, then let them know that you appreciate having that choice and that you'd like more of that choice within the store. Um, the one, one worry I have is about leaving the, the plastic packaging back is, is does it actually go in the right places? Is, is the shop actually going to be bothered segregating it and putting it in the right places? So what can get recycled can. I know you'll do that at home properly, but will they do that in the busy supermarket environment? I don't know. And again, just remember there, any kind of soft plastics, anything you can squish in your hands cannot be recycled. It has to go in your rubbish bin. Only hard plastics um, when they're absolutely clean and dry can go in your recycling bin. And another top tip is please don't put your recycling in a black bag, uh, in a black bin bag. In fact, if you can stop using black bin bags altogether, that would be an amazing thing to do. And um, those black bin bags just get tangled up in the conveyor belts in the recycling plants. You don't need them. Everything can go loose into your recycling bin, into the wheelie bin that you have for recycling. You should be able to tip that wheelie bin upside down and everything in there, you should be able to pick through it. It should all be clean and dry. Um, so that also means less black plastic bags to, to buy, which is a, a good thing. I, I don't mean to be the one kind of passing the questions on all the time. No, I was, 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 to. I was just going to say, oh, when yes, I do yes, that. Annette, jump in there, please. Yes. Yeah, there was somebody, I'm not sure who it's from, and they were looking for you to expand on the use of bamboo for toothbrushes. Yeah, dude, there was really interesting research on uh, yesterday. I don't know if people heard on the radio. My dad actually rang me to say that on Claire Byrne and Radio One, there was a um, a dentist who's into sustainable dentistry on the on the radio, um, talking about what was the most sustainable toothbrush. Um, and he had been shocked to find out that his electric toothbrush was not the most sustainable option. <laughs> um, obviously, electric toothbrushes have the advantage that you don't have to change the whole toothbrush each time. You just change the head on the toothbrush. Now the heads of those toothbrushes are not recyclable, unfortunately, because there's one type of plastic in the bristles and another type of plastic in the, in the, the kind of the, um, the stem. Um, also, if you have a plastic, if you have a, a, an electric toothbrush, then try and make sure it's one that charges actually from the wall or if it's got batteries, change those batteries for rechargeable batteries. Try gradually to change all the batteries in your house over to rechargeable batteries. That's a fantastic thing that you do. And obviously remember to recycle batteries. Do never put them in your rubbish bin. They should not go in your rubbish bin. They're toxic waste. You need to take them back to any supermarket should have one of those blue boxes for yeah. you to put them in um, and so they can be recycled. Um, so bamboo toothbrushes obviously are not plastic. Again, you have to grow the bamboo that requires water, it requires land. So the research that the guy presented yesterday suggested that bamboo toothbrushes were also not the, the solution. In my book, what I also talk about are um, a new type of toothbrush where you make the entire toothbrush out of one type of plastic so that at the end of its life, you can actually recycle it. Um, but those are only starting to come on stream now. Um, there are some people that are looking actually also at using recycled plastic to make toothbrushes. So it's plastic that is given another life and then may be able to be recycled again. And most, one of the most exciting things that I found and is featured as a good news story in the book <laughs> and is a new type of electric toothbrush that would again last a long time, but doesn't even have batteries in it. You wind it, 
you wind it up and all you change is the tip top of the brush. So it's a, a winding mechanism and that's something that um, is just being patented at the moment and I hope will be available soon. So listen, there's no perfect answer to this and you change what you can. In my house, I, uh, I love bamboo toothbrushes and so does my son. My husband won't use one and neither will my daughter. Uh, they both have electric toothbrushes that are wedded to, uh, they love them. So, you know, you change what you can. Um, as I say to people, my husband also has a sneaky bottle of fairy liquid in the cupboard because he doesn't like my <laughs> eco-friendly washing up liquid. You know, you do, you do what you can, change what you can um, and try something out. You know, I, as I say, I like the bamboo toothbrushes with them. You, you chop the bristles off them, at, off them at the end and then they can go in your compost bin or your food waste bin. Or you can, you know, write on them and use them as little um, markers for your seedlings come next spring. There's lots and lots of ways you can reuse them. Yeah, as long as the um, the fairy liquid isn't grounds for divorce, you know, you'll be all right. Well, this is it. I can't divorce them over a bit of fairy liquid. So there's some things you have to let go. <laughs> um, Maura, um, Maura Turner is asking what your views are on incinerators My views as opposed on to landfill. You know, do we have it and do we have a choice as to how our waste is um, is disposed of? So at the moment, the what we all need to do, number one, is consume less stuff. Um, so as long as we keep consuming, um, which, which we always will. I mean, we will always have to eat food and there, are, there will always be some type of wrapping on things. But as long as we keep consuming, and in Ireland, we, we can, we're big consumers. When you look at um, data from across the world, we are in the top consumers. We spend a lot of money and we buy a lot of stuff. So if we keep buying stuff, then we have to be we are making waste and that waste has to go somewhere what we want to get to and which you may have noticed there was a new policy from government uh, last week all around a circular economy and a circular economy what that means is instead of doing what we do now which is kind of a linear model where we extract stuff from the earth we make a product we use it and we throw it away and um, instead of doing that we look at how can we make something out of a byproduct of something else or if we're new using a natural resource to make something how can we make it to use it so it can be repaired reused repurposed into something else so that everything goes back into a system of reuse so we stop going back to the earth to take natural resources each time um, and you know we're just not there yet but we have to get there and until then we have to do something with our waste we can't leave it at big piles at the end of our housing estates so at the moment, the ways that we have of, of getting rid of waste are a landfill, which is a, a hole in the ground, absent of oxygen, where our waste sits for literally hundreds and thousands of years and doesn't really break down because there's no air in there to help it break down. Or we incinerate it, um, which means that we burn it at very high temperatures and put all kinds of filters and scrubbers on the chimneys to try and prevent any negative impacts of the burning and the toxins that may be in that air getting into our atmosphere. Is either of them perfect? No. Uh, do we have a choice? No, until we stop producing less waste and we have to do something with it. So uh, we're in a bind on that one and it should hopefully drive us to be far more creative around thinking about how we make things and what we make them out of. Okay, thank See, you. In coming in on chat there, when you mentioned the rechargeable batteries, mm. um, Tony was asking that, or sorry, he says that he finds that rechargeable batteries lose their charge very quickly. Um, and have you any suggestions or is that something you've come across yourself? They will lose their charge a little bit more quickly than a regular sort of high performance battery. Um, but if you get ones that are, you know, from a good brand where they've invested in them, prop in them properly, then they, they should last longer. So. I don't know. I don't know how long he has his or whether just they're just getting a little bit exhausted at this stage. Maybe he needs um, some newer ones. Remember, you can recycle their rechargeable batteries, too. Um, but, you know, even if they don't last as long, all you have to have is one of the little recharging boxes in your house and, you know, leave them in there overnight and they're ready to go again. You can recharge them and recharge them and recharge them. So in the end of the day, for this money savings and for the environmental savings, I, I, I definitely think they're worthwhile, even if they're... Um, how long they last is a little, little bit less. Um, and you should be able to find them. I find that they're, you know, not every shop stocks a good supply of them. I was in my local Super Value looking for them the other day. Um, they did have them and they had a, a new type of rechargeable battery that was also made partly out of recycled batteries. So then we're starting to, that's kind of circular mm -hmm. economy that I was describing mm -hmm. where you take an old battery to make a new battery. 
you make the new battery so it can be reused and reused and reused multiple times before it even gets recycled back into another battery. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we're trying to get to. And Annette, sorry, I'm going to jump in on this one then. But just Go ahead. why somebody's asked, um, why can't the recycling companies invest in recycling more material? Um, so I suppose so they, they do limit us, don't they, into what we can put into our green bin and our brown bin. They limit like us that. because That's there it. has to be a market for <clears throat> the waste. Um, so what we have to get to a point is where we don't create waste anymore. We look only at waste as a resource. And so when you look at bales of aluminium cans, right, they're clearly a resource. Aluminium is, a, is, is extracted from the ground. It's a very valuable commodity. And aluminium can be recycled over and over and over and over again. Plastic can't. Plastic can be recycled a few times and then it becomes, um, it, it, it degrades to such a, uh, and the fibers become too short so you, you can't use it again. Um, but aluminium is something we can use over and over again. So all those drink containers, for example, they're a valuable commodity. People want to buy those by the bale and there are places that will recycle them because there's an economic value that is a resource. Yeah. Um, it's the same for like hard plastics. You can take, you can collect up the plastic, hard plastic containers and punnets that things are in and you can make those into buckets and um, fence posts, fleeces, all that kind of thing. So there's a market for them. The soft plastic we can't recycle because it is of poor quality and it tends to be a mix of all kinds of different types of plastic. And so we're making something that can't be reused, repurposed or recycled. So that's a bad idea. So we ideally need to not make soft plastic packaging. So ideally down the line, your Brennan's bread, or your bag of pasta would come in a compostable um, film rather than, uh, rather than this plastic, which can last literally hundreds of years and which we can do nothing with at the moment. So there has to be a market for it. So all of these things are resources that we um, need to start looking at in different ways and valuing in different ways. I always find when I look at TV programs, um, particularly from the US, that you see people coming out of the supermarket and they're all carrying large brown paper bags. Everything is packed in brown paper rather than the plastic bags that we have had for, you know, mm -hmm. you don't get brown paper bags anymore really in the supermarkets here, except for specialised things like a potato bag or a mushroom bag or something like that. So well, no, this, neither should you because yeah. you have a reusable bag, I'm sure, Billy. Well, now, of course, yes. <laughs> But it's just, yeah. I was amazed that like, the paper bags seem to be kind of the norm in the US. Again, but it's a TV thing, I suppose, more than anything. Yeah, else. well, I think it's one of the rare things that, <laughs> that they might be getting right. I think we're streets ahead of them with our reusable bags here. Um, and that's a great, that plastic bag tax is an absolute sign of how adaptable we are and how clever we are as consumers. We all now have in the back of the car or by the front door, um, reusable bags that we all completely now, by habit, take out when we're going shopping. It's no longer a big deal. It's no longer a hassle. Um, but every, every time we do that, like imagine if, if all of those were still new plastic bags, the problem we'd be creating. It's oil, like oil from the ground, petroleum that those bags are made from, plus loads of chemical additives, and they cannot be recycled. So every time you avoid one, you are doing a good job. Um, and just to add there, if you do like to choose the loose fruit and veg when you go to the supermarket, um, you can avoid again the plastic bags they have there. Some, some shops now have compostable bags that you can choose, but even better than them is to have a little set of cotton bags. You can buy them, you could make them yourselves uh, and, and bring those and use those to put your fruit and veg in. They don't weigh anything, so they're not going to like increase the, the weight of the product when you go to the um, supermarket. And again, that cuts down on all of those single use little you know, little flimsy plastic bags that are by the fruit and veg counters in many shops. Is there, are there other questions there? there are, sorry, I, was, I was waiting for Carol to jump in there, but to, I'm, just, I'm not sure if she can see them or whatever there on, on her screen. So you know, I'll just take it while, while we're waiting. Um, okay. Somebody mentioned that on the TV that labels on products, um, they've seen that labels on products have now moved to just two symbols. One being that they can be recycled and others, the other one being that they cannot be recycled. Mm. That's something I haven't noticed myself actually. So this was covered on the BBC programme War on Plastic. Um, there are these new, um, these new symbols that are being created which are striving to tell us uh, more about uh, and to make it simpler to know what to recycle. Because if you want to be confused, look at the symbols on, on packaging. Mm. Probably most of you think that that little circular one uh, means that the product can be recycled. It doesn't. It just means that the people who made that product have contributed their fees to repack to support recycling. That's all that that means. So the confusion around recycling labels is 
huge. I could do you a whole talk just on recycling labels. So these new labels are, 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 are striving to make it easier, but they're also finding that expressions like widely recycled, for example, doesn't really help anybody out. Widely recycled. Does that mean I can put it in the recycling bin at my house or not? What does that mean? And so there, uh, one move that they were looking at in the UK and which if it changes there could in, inform what we do here as well, is just clearly saying can be or can't really be recycled on the back of it to make it simpler for people. Um, and I personally think that we need to start having these kinds of clear directions, not just on packaging, which is the only place we put these symbols now, but on the back of everything we buy. So when I use, finish using this hardback notebook, that's sort of shiny on the front, what can I do with it? It doesn't tell me what I can do with it. Um, when I'm finished using this glass, what can I do with it? Nothing tells me what I can do with it on it. So I think we need these kind of labels on everything that tells us at the end of its life, how can we reuse it, repurpose it or recycle it? Um, that would definitely make life better. I also saw in the Q&A there, guys, you see there's questions being asked in two places. Someone asked about bathroom hygiene. Can you suggest a friendly toilet cleaner? Um, Bleach is not a friendly option, but it's effective. That's from Maura as well. Yeah, Maura, I have an eco-friendly toilet cleaner that I use. Um, I actually buy it from a girl that supplies it locally um, in like big reusable um, buckets, uh, plastic buckets that I send back to her. But you can make it yourself. So you can buy it, like you can buy Ecover makers. Some of the shops like Dunn's or Super Value have their own uh, brand, Eco brand. Or you can make it yourself. If you look it up online, that kind of toilet cleaner is literally made out of vinegar, bread, soda, and something like uh, lavender oil or something like that to make it smell nice. That's all that's in them. Um, vinegar, vinegar and bread soda can clean almost anything. So much so I have like two pages in the book just of recipes of um, cleaning products you can make just out of oil, out of vinegar and, and bread soda. I mean, they're two of the most amazing, amazing ingredients and they're in what, what's in a lot of this stuff. So you can also just make it yourself. Um, so Lily's Eco Clean is one of the toilet cleaners that I've used. Um, and again, the main ingredient in it is vinegar. Um, so nothing too complicated there. Um, and also Annette and Carol, I just noticed then, yeah, I heard soft plastics are now being recycled into park benches. Um, at the moment, no, our soft plastics are not being recycled into anything. Sorry. We are recycling hard plastics. So like empty Coke uh, bottles, milk containers, those kind of things. Um, are being recycled. There may be something on a tiny scale that one factory is experimenting with, but in general, no, none of our soft plastics are being collected from the recycling. They're all getting, um, most of them are actually getting incinerated, yeah. Um, Annette, what else is there? I just saw those two in the Q&A. Yeah, no, that was it. That's, that's it, but there's no- Is there more in the chat there that I missed? Uh, no, I think we've covered everything there. I've been yeah, well, keeping an eye on it. So I think we're, unless anybody has anything else that, oh, here we go. So somebody has come back about soft plastic in Australia. Oh, in Australia, in, yeah. yeah. So different countries are different things. They may have someone in Australia that is collecting soft plastic. So if in Ireland someone set themselves up with a machine that would take soft, a certain type of soft plastic, you can't absolutely make um, furniture from it. Um, it's just nobody's doing it and therefore there is no market for it. Nobody will buy it. So therefore the recycling centers can't collect it to sell to somebody. So there's huge opportunities for new business ideas and new innovations around how to reuse waste to make it into something else. And again, if we don't reuse it each time, we have to go back to the ground to, to take that oil out of the ground to make a new product. So, you know, every single bit of plastic around you has, has, has its origins in, in petroleum extracted from the earth. And um, plus the addition of a whole lot of chemical plasticizers and various different things that give it particular qualities in terms of being flexible or stretchy or hard or tough. Um, and it's the combination of all of those things um, in the environment is, 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 what, is what is worrying because you actually don't even know what the combined effect of all of those is on the environment. Or, you know, you'll have read that all of these microplastics end up in our food. So there's micro and nanoplastics in my water, in your beer, in your bread, in the fish that you eat. We're all eating plastic all of the time. And we have absolutely no idea yet what the health impacts of that are in terms of what happens to it when it's inside our guts and inside our bodies. That's all yet to be discovered. That's not very cheery. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose we've gone from yeah, to, from making our own toilet cleaner to, to things like that. So uh, it's been a, it's been an interesting discussion this morning, Tara. Thank you very much for 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 joining us. Um, and I see yeah, the comments are coming back in. One of the things I suppose that um, after the last talk that we had, 
was and um, people were very kind of uh, gracious about uh, coming back to me and giving sending me some comments which I will send back to you if we get them later in the day uh, and from people and I did say to Tara when I was talking to her originally about this was please don't be afraid to shamelessly plug your book <laughs> and I know you did but I'm putting it up again here also on the screen so I hope people can see that so the book is called How to Save Your Planet One Object at a Time by Dr. Tara Shine, and it's available in all good bookstores. Unfortunately, we don't have one for everyone in the audience this morning, but, uh, but I'm sure if you go to, to your local bookshop or to, as you said earlier on, wherever you buy your books from, then it's, it's readily available. And it's, it's a really good read, really good read. So Tara, thank you very much for joining us this morning. There's and, one more um, question there. There's just oh, one sorry, more. Okay. Yeah, sorry. it was about yeah, the, the dreaded masks. Oh, okay. Um, Right. Yeah, about the dreaded masks. They're mm. awful yokes. They're, they're like so. Number one, um, yeah, a cotton reusable mask is just as good as one of those disposable masks. The disposable masks are made of plastic. So yes, if in your bra, in your rubbish bin, in a dump on the side of the road, hundreds of years it will take them to break down. They're not made out of paper. They're made out of plastic. So if you if you can get a cotton mask that's reusable, washable, that's definitely um, the way to go. Um, and just one other question that came in there, someone who watched the Nationwide mm -hmm. program was really confused about this ball thing that I held up that you could put in instead of washing detergent. Um, these things are called eco eggs. Um, it's a plastic egg with these little um, beads inside it. And it is the action of the two types of beads that cleans your clothes. And so you buy one of those and it's good for 70 washes or 80 washes before you change the beads inside it. It means you don't use laundry detergent anymore. So they cost 20 something euros to buy. So more than more than your average uh, box of washing powder or washing liquid. Um, but you get a lot more washes out of it. And then you don't put any chemicals at all, um, any detergents at all into your washing machine. And they work. I've used one. Uh, I have one. I need to change the beads in it again. Um, the only thing that's different is your clothes don't come out with the smell of the detergent. That's the only thing that's different. In terms of cleaning power, it cleans really well. Um, but that's what that thing is. You, you can look for them in like an eco shop. Actually, some of the little eco stalls in um, Super Values have them, have them for sale as well. Um, or look online. No, the beads are not microbeads. They're, not a, they're, they're made out of it. They're a little mineral. They're nothing to do with microbeads. Microbeads are, are microplastics. They are very bad to be avoided at all costs. And um, these are like a, they're about that size and they're made from a mineral. And it is the action of these two different minerals together that causes the cleaning, the cleaning um, product, uh, the cleaning action um, that replaces the detergent. So no they're, no, they're not bad for the environment. They're a good alternative. But that's what those are. Oh, Billy, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Sorry, I was, I knew I was a, uh, uh, being quiet there, uh, which is not like me. Um, so thank you, Tara, again. Um, and I suppose that idea of, of replacing detergent, that's something I'm always kind of uh, uh, interested in, because I think some of the stuff that we use both to clean our clothes and to clean ourselves is probably more toxic and affects us in, in, in lots of ways than, than what we did in the past, I suppose. Um, yeah, and I mean, even with, even with those balls, a lot of the people that are using them are people whose kids have eczema, who have mm -hmm. problems with their skin and who are finding getting rid of detergent completely is, is, is helping their skin. So that might be the reason they would make the change. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, listen, everybody, I know we still have 30, well, we, we, we had 42 participants at one stage, we hit a high mm -hmm. of 42. And I know as time has gone on, people have, have other things to do, maybe we'll have appointments to go to. So we're still, we have 34 people still online. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. We will be in touch with you. Um, if that's okay in terms of um, contact you via email with some of the talks that we have lined up for Positive Aging Week and um, just uh, signing off for today. So thanks again to Tara. Okay. Thank Good you all. Thank you for all the questions. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.